Charles Dickens said, a loving heart is the truest wisdom. The Beatles sung, all you need is love. While Snoopy jokes that love is sharing your popcorn. Well, search the internet for love and you'll come up with more than 17 billion hits. But what does God teach us about love? Well, that's what we're thinking about today as we study 1 Peter chapter 4. Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offences. One Peter four, seven to eleven. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, when I was in my early 20s, I did what many young South Africans do. I packed my bags and went to work overseas. I arrived in London, and after staying with a friend for a bit, it was time to find my own place. Well, Gumtree had just started a website uh, where those living abroad could find accommodation for rent. Well, I didn't have a job yet, and so I scanned uh, for the cheapest possible options. I found a place in the East End. Of London. Now, you may have heard of the West End. That's the part where many of the theatres are located. It's a fashionable and upmarket area. Oxford Street, Selfridges, Hamleys, Fortnum and Mason are all located there. Well, the East End is the opposite. It has a history of poverty, overcrowding and social problems. It's changed a bit now with the Olympic Park. But when I arrived in 2000, it was still pretty rough, which of course is why it was so cheap. Well, law and funds and without a job, I snapped up the first place I could get. It was a four-bedroom house with 11 of us staying there. There was one bathroom. We were one big, happy family. Well, maybe not always happy. With so many people in one place, tensions sometimes ran high. There was often a queue for the bathroom, but we muddled along okay for the most part. We were all young and clueless, but we were young and clueless together. We'd go kick a rugby ball at the nearby park, trek halfway across London for the free weekend barbecue at a local pub, laugh about the cultural differences we experienced, and of course, Talk about the weather, which is a quintessentially British thing to do. But living on top of each other meant that when I went on holiday, well, I was quite happy to go off on my own. I'd take up my backpack and go trekking around Europe, which was great, except when I was standing in front of the Eiffel Tower, or next to the Colosseum, or walking up the Royal Mile with Edinburgh Castle in the distance. Now, don't get me wrong, it was amazing to see these sights up close that I'd only read about. But there was something lacking. I couldn't share the experience with anyone. There was no one to turn to and say, well, look at that. Well, nobody to appreciate the moment with. All my photos are simply of the buildings. At those times, dare I say, I missed my ten other housemates. Well, how great it would have been to have them there with me, to gaze at the Mona Lisa together, to stroll down the Spanish steps side by side, to put on an awful Scottish accent. <laughs> well, the reason I felt that way is because of what it means to be human. Well, God created us in his image, and as his image bearers, we have something of God's nature in us. And part of that nature has to do with who God is. God is three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, God is three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And this means that God created us to be in relationship with each other, just as the three persons of the Trinity are in close relationship with each other. Which is why it comes as no surprise that there are numerous commands in the New Testament for how we should and shouldn't relate to one another. 59 of them, in fact. 59 one another statements. Actually, not statements, but commands. 
imperatives that form the basis for all true Christian community. They instruct us on one anothering one another. Well, three of these one another commands occur in chapter 4 of 1 Peter. They appear one after another in verses 8, 9, and 10. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at each of them in turn. We'll begin today with the one another in verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Well, you won't be surprised that a third of the one another commands are about love. They instruct Christians to love one another. Of course, Christian love is to go beyond love of our own tribe, after all, Jesus summed up all of the law as love God and love your neighbor. But the love that Peter speaks of here is specifically for those in our church family. So what does it look like to love one another or more accurately to keep loving one another? And Peter assumes that his hearers do love one another and so he encourages them to keep on loving each other. Well, what does that look like? Well, I've got three points for us. First up, what love isn't. Well, let's look back to chapter 1 to see what Peter says about loving one another, reading from verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Well, there's lots in those verses we won't have time to look at, but here's the point. Christians are the people of God, or as Peter calls us in chapter 2, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And our distinguishing mark should be love. That's why Peter says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Well, love takes priority over any other Christian virtue. Love is a supreme attribute for the Christian. Well, the church should be a place that oozes love, where love for one another overflows. But before we get to what love is, well, Peter reminds us of what love isn't. And he does that by telling us to put away certain things, things that are the opposite of loving one another. Well, let me read them. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Well, malice is a translation of the Greek word kakia. Well, it's a bit unfortunate for us South Africans because well, it's very similar to a rude word in Afrikaans. But actually the meaning is pretty similar. Well, kakia was the Greek goddess of vice and immorality. Her name meant bad or evil. Now, it's not the name you'd choose for your newborn baby girl. Uh, kakia conveys the idea of being mean-spirited, of having a, a vicious attitude towards someone which is why it's often translated as malice or ill will, hatefulness or spite. It's to cause pain or injury or distress to someone else. It's a desire to hurt others and then rejoice in their suffering. It's to have it in for someone. In 2011, Jerry Rice and his wife Janice outbid Kathy Rowe on a house in San Diego. Well, Kathy didn't take the defeat lightly. She began a year-long campaign to punish the couple. She signed them up to magazine subscriptions worth thousands of dollars, uh, used a fake name to relist the house for sale on the internet so that would-be buyers began turning up at the door. She dropped leaflets around the neighborhood warning that a sex offender had moved onto their street. On July 4th, Independence Day in America, she advertised their address as a source of free fireworks. On Valentine's Day, she sent romantic cards supposedly from Jerry to wives in the area, making their husbands furious. She posted adverts for fake parties at their home, including a New Year's Eve party for high school teenagers. And finally, and most disturbing of all, she posted their photos on sex sites, inviting men to come and have sex with Janice while Jerry was at work. Well, if you thought you had neighbor problems, well, they're a small fry compared to this lot. When do you recognize malice in your heart? Do you wish to do someone else harm? Do you rejoice when someone you don't like has a failure? Well, malice destroys fellowship, which is why Peter tells us to put it away. Well, deceit comes from the Greek word dolos. Well, dolos was another one of the Greek gods. He was the god of trickery, deception, craftiness, treachery, and guile. The word originally referred to bait, you know, the bit of food placed on a hook to entice fish. It meant to tell someone something that isn't true, so that you trick or mislead them. Remember the story of Jacob and Esau. You know, Esau goes off to hunt game for his father, 
But while he's doing that, well, Jacob's mom whips up a quick goat dish. She then disguises Jacob so that he can receive the blessing from his dad. When Esau brings his food later, the deception is revealed. Isaac says, your brother came deceitfully, and he's taken away your blessing. And this drove a wedge between the brothers for 20 years. Well, flattery and falsehood are the tricks of the trade for the deceiver. The intent is to mislead others to their own hurt. Of course, the greatest deceiver in the Bible is the devil, who Revelation calls the deceiver of the whole world. Well, in contrast, Christians should follow the example of Jesus. Peter describes Jesus in this way, in verse 22 of chapter 2. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Well, we're to follow in his footsteps. Christians must put away all deceit. Well, hypocrisy is a word that originally referred to an actor. In ancient Greek theatre, large masks were worn by actors to show which character they were playing. And over time, the word came to refer to any person who wore a figurative mask, pretending to be something or someone that they weren't. Well, to be a hypocrite is to portray a, a, a false image to people. If our behavior at church is inconsistent with how we behave at home or at work, well, we're being hypocrites. Perhaps today you've had an argument with your spouse, or the kids have been fighting, and you've responded in anger. Maybe you were running late in the traffic, and the person in front was driving so slowly that you missed the light, and out popped a swear word. Perhaps your eyes lingered a little too long on the jogger who ran past, or you were gossiping. But then when you walk into church, well, you're the perfect Christian. And that's not to say that you should bring those behaviors into church with you. But when our walk doesn't match our talk, well, we're engaging in hypocrisy. Well, the Christian life is hard, full of struggles. And we don't need to put on a mask or pretend that everything is hunky-dory when it's not. We're to put away hypocrisy and be real with each other. Well, envy is the green-eyed monster, as William Shakespeare famously called it. To be jealous of another person or their possessions, to want what others have. When we feel sad about the happiness of others, their abilities, prosperity, fame, or work success, well, we're being envious. An envious person hates the good fortune of others and delights when others fail or lose what they have. Before I became a pastor, I taught maths at a school in Kailicha, and one of the things my students told me was that in the township, people didn't want you to succeed. If they thought you were raising yourself too far above your station, they would respond, often with violence. If you bought yourself a new car, you risked it being vandalized. The students were often accosted on the way to school. Their uniform marked them out as attending this elite school. So you think you're better than us. Well, we'll take you down a peg or two. But the heart of all that thinking is envy. Have you found yourself checking out the cars as you walk into church? Maybe you parked next to your dream vehicle and a tinge of envy crept into your heart. Or you hate it when others are successful. He gets all the breaks. Well, she landed with her bum in the butter. Do you find yourself wanting what others have? You know, I, I wish my husband would be more like him. If only my wife dressed like her. You know, I'd love to be able to play the guitar like him or sing like her. Well, envy is the enemy of joy. It robs us of our happiness, causes us to worry, encourages dissatisfaction, and creates the desire in us for others to fail rather than succeed. Well, we need to put envy away. Well, slander is to speak against someone, bad-mouthing, gossip, evil speech. Have you seen what she's wearing today? Well, I heard that he's been fired from his job. Of course, often we Christianize our slander or pray for Tim and Tammy. They're having problems in their marriage. Well, you don't really care about the couple. You just want to share that juicy morsel, that tasty, tasty tidbit of gossip. And so you couch your words in the language of care and concern. Well, the Bible calls us to bridle our tongues, to use our words to build others up, not break them down. So think before you speak. There's no room in Christian communication for slander. We're to put it away. And so those are five things that love isn't. Christians must put away all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Becoming a Christian means changing your wardrobe. Well, these five vices aren't appropriate for those who are born again. To continue in them is to harbor a relational garbage pit on the inside. So stop making excuses for such behavior. These vices have no place in the Christian life, and there should be no room for them inside the church. They all touch on how we relate to one another, and they're the opposite of what love looks like. So be done with them. Well, that's what love isn't. Now let's look at what love is. 
And once again, Peter gives us some examples earlier in the letter. Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Well, Peter calls us to have unity of mind. Now, this doesn't mean that we all need to think exactly the same. That we need to all agree on what color to paint the walls, or what the council should spend money on, or which songs to sing in church. Well, Peter calls us to unity, not uniformity. But it does mean that we're united in a common purpose. And that's because we're united in Christ. I suppose we could think of it a bit like an orchestra. An orchestra is made up of flutes, oboes, clarinets, horns, trumpets, trombones, violins, and various other instruments, all of which make a variety of different sounds. But when played together, well, they create magnificent symphonies. Well, the problem is that we behave like toddlers. We think that the world revolves around me. Now, ownership laws for toddlers boil down to one simple concept. It's mine. If I like it, it's mine. If I can take it from you, or if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. You must never think it's yours, unless, of course, it's broken. And even then, well, the pieces are mine. And so we blast our own trumpet as if we're the only instrument in the orchestra. Selfish actions and pride cause disunity. Well, God calls us to agree with each other, laying aside differences so we can remove any type of division, allowing us to live in true harmony. Now, being of one mind doesn't mean that all differences need to be abolished. We can hold distinct biblical convictions while still upholding unity and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ to hold different convictions. Even the early church didn't always agree on everything, but they were united on what mattered most, the person and work of Jesus, his sacrificial death for our sins, his resurrection and return. And that's what unites us too. Or sympathy is to feel the same thing as someone else, to walk in their shoes. When we love our brothers and sisters, then their misfortune or sickness or even death affects us. We sympathize with those who are struggling. We draw alongside them in prayer and practical ways. We visit those in hospital who are sick. We support pastoral care who supply meals to those who struggle financially. We take meals to parents who have new babies because we know what a hectic time that is. We pray for each other when sickness or death strikes, or when marriages are under severe strain. And we do that because we have a genuine concern for one another. We want to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also weep with those who weep. We ask what we can do to be of help. How can we assist in their time of need? We enter into the joy or sorrow of fellow believers. If one member of the body suffers, all the members suffer with it. Our lives are so woven together that what hurts one hurts the other. We cry when a member of our family is hurting. Or do we have the same sympathy for our church family? And brotherly love. Well, I have an older brother, and while we were growing up, I remember numerous incidents that I wouldn't exactly call loving. We had some pretty serious fights and arguments. But if ever anyone threatened my brother, well, I'd be the first to defend him, and vice versa, because that's what family does. And we're not to view each other as strangers or distant relatives, mere acquaintances who we sit next to Sunday after Sunday, but never really get to know. All of us have the same father, so all of us are brothers and sisters. So I hope you at least know the name of the people sitting around you at church. Now, we can't love each other if we don't know each other. Well, the city of Cozumo in Mexico hosted the World Triathlon Series back in 2016. The swim and cycle were complete with Johnny Brownlee leading comfortably, leading into the final, uh, heading into the final kilometer of the run. But the heat began to take its toll and he started to weave across the course, dazed with heat stroke. Well, Alistair Brownlee shunned the chance to win the race and came to the aid of his brother. Putting his arm around his sibling, he helped him to the finish line. South African Henry Schumann ended up winning the race, but his victory was overshadowed by the remarkable actions of the Brownlee brothers. Well, that's what brotherly love means. And that's how we're to love each other. And so we offer a lift to the elderly or those who don't have transport to church. We invite the single person to our home for a meal. We pay the family camp fees for those who can't afford it. We offer to babysit for a couple so they can have a night out together. We serve each other. Opportunities for love are endless. Well, have a tender heart. Well, the literal translation is to feel generous in your belly, in your insides, your internal organs. Well, in Peter's day, people, people thought that the deepest emotions originated in the abdominal region. Well, this is love that comes from deep inside us. Peter's saying, be deeply considerate towards others.
The church ought to be the place where the walking wounded feel at home. If you're distressed or anguished or coming to church, it should feel like stepping into a spiritual clinic where tender-hearted healing is freely administered. The problem is that most of us have a hard heart. I find that I can read the news nowadays and be utterly unaffected by what I read. In our internet and social media age, we're overwhelmed with the amount of sorrow in our lives. We're bombarded with heartbreaking news 24-7. As we consume all of this bad news, we erect a barrier to keep our hearts safe because well, being tender hurts. Well, no person has suffered during their lifetime more than Jesus. He was rejected, mocked, lied about and killed, but his heart remained tender. And so we follow his example. If we're tender-hearted, we'll do more than merely feel compassion when we see someone hurting, vulnerable or in need of help. Like the Good Samaritan, we'll be motivated to act with kindness and mercy. Well, tender-heartedness is love in action. The tender-hearted Christian sees other people's problems and then works to help resolve them. We don't distance ourselves from others who are hurting. We don't ignore people's concerns or view others as just another problem to be fixed. We share a word of encouragement. We, we pray for each other and we bear one another's burdens. We'll have a humble mind. Well, the Greeks scorned humility. Humility wasn't seen as a virtue. It was considered a weakness. Humility was associated with conquered peoples and slaves. Greeks aspired to self-confidence, self-esteem and self-assertiveness. Well, not much has changed. And note that all those things start with the word, well, self. Well, self-love poisons relationships. Humility seeks the good of the other. Humility means setting ourselves aside and making others the focus of our attention. Humility is a willingness to esteem others higher than yourself. Not mine, but yours. Not me, but you. Not self, but others. F.B. Mayer, a Baptist pastor who lived a century ago, said, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves, one above the other, and that the taller we grew in the Christian character, well, the easier we should reach them. I find now that God's gifts are on shelves, one beneath the other, and that it's not a question of growing taller, but of stooping lower, and that we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. Our current Baptist pastor Rick Warren said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Humility is thinking more of others. Well, the humble Christian thinks of others first and not of themselves. Well, those are five things that love is. And Peter tells us that we're to do these things earnestly. Other translations say deeply or fervently. The word was used to describe the muscles of an athlete straining to win a race. If you've ever watched sprint events, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, think Wade van Niekerk in the 400 meters. You know, the athletes are already straining every single muscle, but then just as they reach the finish line, well, they thrust their body forward. It's a technique known as a dip finish. The aim is to get your torso across the finish line and first and, and win the race. Every fiber in your body is under serious strain. Well, this is to exert yourself to the limit. Well, that ups the ante about what our love should look like. Love requires effort, intense effort. Now, love isn't easy. It will cost us. Do we go out of our way to love others? Or do we only love if it's convenient or if we have time? Well, Christians make love a priority because God first loved us in Jesus. And we demonstrate the love of Jesus by loving others. And then finally, what love does. Well, listen to Peter again. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Well, the sins that are being covered here are the sins of fellow Christians. Not your own sins, not the sins of those outside the church, but the failure of Christian brothers and sisters to live as they ought. Now we need to be a bit careful here. Peter isn't saying that our acts of love for each other can earn God's forgiveness. Nor does Peter mean that we can pay our sins off through good works. Well, that would contradict what Peter and other New Testament writers clearly teach. Now, our sins are paid for by Jesus' death on the cross. Forgiveness of sin comes only through putting our faith in him. But until Jesus returns, well, we'll continue to mess up to sin. We're not perfect. And hopefully as we mature in our faith, we move away from sin and towards holiness, but we will still make mistakes, and so love for each other includes forgiving each other. 
overlooking past hurts and building each other up when we fall. And this isn't sweeping sin under the rug or endorsing bad behavior. It's not renouncing church discipline. Love isn't blind. It simply chooses to overlook, to cover. Well, many years ago, our church hosted a breakfast. And the hall was packed and there was only seating at a table at the back. One lady arrived late and so I directed her to the table. I can't sit there, she replied. Well, it turned out that her and another person at the table had a long-standing feud. I don't know what it was about, and to be honest, I can't even remember who the two people were. But that's the exact opposite of what Peter is speaking about. Now, imagine if those two people loved, like Peter tells us here. They strained towards reconciliation. They were willing to forgive, to cover past sin, for the sake of unity and harmony. And so instead of ending up sitting at opposite tables, well, they could have sat next to one another in a restored relationship of love. Well, true love overlooks the faults of our fellow Christians. And as we cover the sins of those who have sinned against us, well, we're simply demonstrating to others what God has done for us in Jesus. The blood of Jesus has covered our sins. What once was scarlet, he's made white as snow. Our motivation for loving others in this way is because, well, that's how God has loved us. Well, let's pray. Father, help us to put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Instead, may we have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Above all, help us to be a people who keep loving one another earnestly. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.